they're, they're really an amazing set of, of questions they've been able to face uh, as a commonwealth and as, as, as citizens who not only vote but also at some point in our lives use the services of the, of the commonwealth. And to what degree we're going to you know, expect service in the future and where's the money to come from to pay for it. I want to actually, before we open the questions, I want to use my prerogative as the convener tonight to ask a sort of a, maybe a bit esoteric and perhaps, and perhaps theoretical question, but I'll ask it anyway because I'm an academic. If you could devise the perfect, this obviously the entire group to think about and to respond, if you could devise the optimal diverse range of sources of revenue for the Commonwealth, what would it be? That is, in some respects, you know, since we don't have oil revenue, since we don't get revenue, we, you know, that's just like a lot of states, has to rely on a range of revenue sources. And if your point has been that we've been overly reliant on capital gains taxes, New York, I think, is the same way as some other states, uh, which is great when the stock market is booming, but bad, you know, right now, and if there are only really so many sources of revenue, short, well, okay, gambling casinos, I suppose, could be one of them uh, in another way. But what would be the optimal, in your mind, uh, array of revenue sources that the Commonwealth should, in fact, uh, rely on if you could devise that kind of a system? I'll leave that open for everybody to answer. The, the mics are live. So please speak into the mics. Well, well we, given that we need more revenue, I think, Question is where do you, where do you raise it from? Uh, there was a, a small increase, well, uh, well, a significant increase in the uh, sales tax from five to six point two five recently. Uh, that revenue source is roughly proportional in terms of uh, proportion to income uh, because it uh, excludes um, clothing, most clothing and, and groceries. So that makes the sales tax a relatively proportional tax. I'd like to see revenue raised in uh, a more uh, a more uh, progressive manner. Uh, and the uh, real estate taxes, on the other hand, tend to be regressive. Uh, cities and towns uh, raise taxes at, at different rates because they have different uh, resources. Uh, and uh, the value of real estate tends to go up with income, but at a slower rate. That makes the real estate tax aggressive. So I wouldn't want to uh, raise revenue from either the sales tax or let uh, leave it to municipalities to raise uh, the property tax. Uh, corporate tax depends upon uh, the economy. It's very volatile. It's relatively small compared to these uh, other uh, forms of uh, revenues. And um, and I, being an economist, I've seen the evidence. It appears that if you lower the corporate tax rate, you will get some response in terms of business formation. So I would not want to raise the corporate tax rate. In fact, I might want to lower it. Uh, that leaves in the income tax, uh, which is, I think, the best candidate for, for raising more revenue. And that can be done in a progressive way, even though our, our tax is by constitutional proportional, uh, by manipulating both the tax rate and the exemption level. So we can raise more revenue in a progressive way uh, by, by use of the uh, income tax. And, and uh, that's, that's where I would raise the need for revenues. And uh, in terms of uh, this business cycles and this recessionary environment, growth and recession, it's also a fair way to raise it uh, because, uh, or to collect revenues, because uh, who pays it? Those who have incomes. So if you get laid off in a recession, your income tax goes down automatically. Uh, uh, families still have to spend money, so the sales tax doesn't respond in the same way, and neither does the property tax. So uh, that would be one thing. I agree with just about everything Alan has just said. I just, um, and I think the income tax doesn't need to be the focus, and it can be made more progressive. Just to add one thing, in terms of capital gains, it's, that's also, that's an important revenue source to cushion the inevitable economic uh, ups and downs, um, and, and, and uh, so that you've got protection if you use it appropriately and build up your rainy day reserves. 
and limit its use in the operating budget. You then have a protection against the going over the cliff. So it's an important revenue source, and it generates a lot of revenue in this state in good times. So it's critical, but it should not be built beyond the billion dollar level into the operating budget. But I, would, I think the income tax is, is, is the key candidate. So I too agree with um, both Alan and Mike. I think um, a couple of other points to make. Um, one is that in addition to the income, so, so we have taxes that cover many of the things that are, um, that are consumed by all. <coughs> There's also a variety of user fees that, that can help to defray the cost of many of the services that people can choose to consume um, for the state. Two other things that, that I'd like to point out. Um, when Mike was talking about, uh, and, and really what was someone illustrated it very well, the problem um, that arose when we became, as a commonwealth, so reliant on the very volatile capital gains tax, one of the reasons that that happened was over the course of um, <coughs> the years before Governor Patrick arrived, there were many, many tax cuts the effect of which was to reduce the base of regular taxes, leaving us more vulnerable to the swings of the capital gains tax. And one way to quantify the effect of some of those tax cuts is if you look at what's known as the tax expenditure budget, meaning the, the amount of tax credits and, um, and deductions that are uh, taken out of, because of uh, provisions in the tax code in the Commonwealth that favor certain kinds of activities, you spend about uh, about $19 billion worth of otherwise uh, collectible taxes are foregone on account of all of those choices made to give this tax exemption, that tax cut, this tax credit <coughs> to various purposes. Now, some of those are, are very useful. They, some of them are like, you know, deductions for you know, children and so forth, but other ones are for very, very specialized um, sectors of the economy, and perhaps uh, it's time to revisit some of those um, in terms of the hard choices that we face. Michael Blake, you. May I pick up on the last point? It's we have something called a film tax credit in this state, <laughs> and according to the Department of Revenue, we pay out $125 million a year to give to uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise or, you know, <laughs> and it is, the Department of Revenue has done an analysis that is, shows the cost and benefit of that. And without getting into the details, it is the most expensive, if you will, tax cut with the least benefit, probably in the history of humanity. But uh, <laughs> certainly on the books of Massachusetts. But it flies in the face of start. So in this fiscal meltdown, we are paying movie companies and actors, and most of the money goes out of state. That's one of the conclusions of the department. $125 million. So when we cut police and fire and teachers, Keep in mind, we have one choice. I mean, it doesn't solve a $2 billion problem, but it's $125 million. There's a direct trade-off between laying off those individuals that we all, I mean, that provide the services that we all expect, and the $125 million we pay the film. If you're real quick for questions, please speak into the mic and uh, address it whenever you want. So a question for Leslie Cohen, and uh, then an observation, a question to the panel. Um, so I, I've heard from a number of people that there's a lot more efficiencies that we could have in the way that we do things within um, the, the expenditures themselves, actually how we implement them. So for example, there's a law um, that exists in Massachusetts that requires that any state um, construction project um, that's bid for that the, sub, the lowest bid subcontractor has to be accepted by the general contractor. And I've heard from general contractors that are regarded as amongst the best in the state who don't participate because of that rule, that there are hundreds of millions of dollars that potentially could be saved if that piece of legislation is to be changed or repealed. So uh, 
question is, is that correct? And secondly, if it is, why don't we just, why don't we take on the various interest groups to change it? Because there's no seven <coughs> whatever the year was, and maybe the program then it's not even more. Linked to that, which is um, you know, Michael's point, which uh, is interesting about the film industry, this is a bigger question. In one of the previous series of sessions that were run, one of the classrooms, is that we had three members of the press, and the question was about you know, what's their role in the future city uh, in the United States. So where are they on these sorts of things? And, you know, we kind of use it as an excuse, but there's something in our role collectively in terms of what we're saying to them and what we're asking them to report on. And why is that analysis not something that one of the more thoughtful columnists has been briefed on and is writing about? Or why is it not an editorial in the globe? Or why is there not an op-ed that's um, being published in the globe or you know, on WBUR or wherever else it happens to be? Um, you know, I just don't understand it, I don't get it. Because these issues are really serious and somebody needs to be shining the light on. Who is it? Okay, we have two different questions. One very specific about contracting, one about the global press. So I'm not going to, I think, tackle exact, whether you've exactly characterized public construction law correctly. There have been two rounds of quite um, hotly debated uh, attempts to reform public construction in the Commonwealth, and you know, many of the, the restrictions in the laws that we have today stem from fixes that were put in to try to respond to corruption allegations and, and findings from earlier projects. Um, so this is tricky, and again, two rounds of legislation to try to make um, public construction law uh, thread the needle better between sort of protecting against corruption and um, having more efficiencies. I'm certainly not going to say that they've got the exact balance right, but the politics around that, as the politics are hot and, and very difficult around many of the savings that one could, could bring about in the budget. So when I say, I, I'm certainly not trying to portray to this audience that Every single dollar in the Commonwealth is spent on a process that has been re-engineered to the point where it's perfect. In fact, I think subsequent um, rounds of cuts in the state sometimes have made processes quite inefficient because in some cases there aren't enough resources to invest properly in either the talent or the technology to make them run well. Sometimes a cut is just a cut. So there's always something that can be done better. I would point to information technology in the Commonwealth over the last couple of years. Governor. Um, higher degree um, uh, CIO who surveyed the landscape of states and, and companies and saw that the best practice is IT consolidation. And so governor's um, whole executive branch has been engaged in a re-engineering of the way information technology is managed, uh, invested in, um, and, and budgeted at the Commonwealth. So there are projects like that that, that you can do. A crisis is a good time to um, to push projects like that, but oftentimes what you need is some seed money and investment to jumpstart your ability to save money. So it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. Public construction is a tough one. It's very, very political, and and you know I'm sure there's still some ways that if the politics could be surmounted, that perhaps some more savings could be gained there. Two large and very important questions. Um, take a crack at each. I guess the session next week, if my correct is on public employee unions, mm -hmm. this is the moment when I introduce um, that from my perspective. Um, the construction is much more expensive here than in other states, and the power of the unions is central to that. Municipal health care is growing at a much more rapid rate, and the, I talk about the municipal health care plan, cities and towns, the last bastion of a $5 copay. And it's growing and chewing up teachers, police, and fire. It's growing at a much higher rate than um, the Group Insurance Commission for the state or in the private sector. So there is no question that the power in this state, that the power of the public employee unions, is a, is a huge obstacle to 
a whole series of reforms. And I think that's the reality. And it's, all, it's, a, it, it, it's a reality, it's also the political reality, of course. I mean, it's not just the fiscal. Um, some of these things are beginning to change uh, because of the fiscal crisis. And with these numbers, the crisis will continue and offer more opportunity. Having said that, I've been surprised at given the enormity of what we face and are going to face um, as a state, even this state, and, this, and the difficulty of it, we should have done more in the reform fund. And I hope 2011, regardless of who's governor and the, leg and the legislature, that we will do that. Having said that, nothing will close a gap of this magnitude, either in the short term or long term. Um, and the example of construction, for example, comes through the capital budget, not the operating budget. Now that doesn't say we shouldn't do it. We should do it because we have these huge capital needs in the Commonwealth that are unmet. And so because of the extra costs that we're paying for, the, uh, for as you described, in that and other ways, there's much less that we can do to meet our infrastructure needs. So it's a very important question and, and the issue of reforms is, is should be central to the next administration. The media um, I mean, <coughs> we all know, I mean, I don't have to review what's happened in terms of uh, the change in media. I mean, I was a wire service reporter <laughs> back, uh, whatever, 40 years ago, I guess. Um, it was a terrific job, and uh, there were standards in journalism in those days, and uh, <laughs> we tried to do uh, uh, you know, really good reporting. Um, and the world, is, we all know, has changed. I think we see something like the Boston Globe, and you know, they're trying to survive, and the paper of record, and over the years they've done some fantastic reporting. But it's fair to say, and they'd be the first to admit, that their reporting of state and local government now is just a fraction of what it used to be. And when you talk about these difficult policy issues, um, it's just they don't feel there's a readership, and they don't have, and they don't have the pages to devote to it. So, uh, but there are columnists who continue to put out some new Scott Lee, I at the Globe wrote some, writes about some of these things. I think WBUR has done a fantastic job. They're doing a series next week um, on um, Route 9 series on five cities and towns along Route 9 and the impact of all of this on, on, on our local community. So um, there are opportunities, but it is a problem. And I think the political problem that I raised, the juxtaposition between perception and reality, which has always been an issue in a democracy. I think given the change in the media, we all agree it's a much more serious issue. Next question. Would you believe this one open it? Well, I can just a quick, uh, uh, another observation is that uh, if, if we are going to raise revenue in the future, uh, then the media has to play a very important role because the public has to be educated to see the necessity of that and indeed how, how it uh, could be done to help uh, uh, most people. Uh, and so there is a critical role for the media. The bandwidth is small. So uh, your point is very important. Okay, John, what's for you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think all of us this evening are grateful you people who have serious comparative technical information advantage over not only the general public, but the people in this room. And we just want to say thank you for the action, the courageous facing the action, because I think we have not only a gap between income and expenditure, but we have an enormous gap between reality and perception. If there wasn't such a large gap, it wouldn't be possible the campaign, seriously campaign, raise money and, and, and put up billboards, arguing basically it's the corruption of the politicians, the waste of the money in the, in, in, in the bureaucracy and th that makes it really make sense to elect new politicians who will attack the reality of the current bureaucratic structure and the weakness of elected politicians. And, and I don't know whether Barry Lustone and other colleagues would hold still for putting together a, a panel of, of, of social psychiatrists. Uh, <laughs> but I think that there needs to be some 
enlarged perception of the, first of all, the reality of the gap on basic factual information uh, uh, between voters and, and I'm not sure experts is the right word, but, but, but the people who, who know something about these issues. Uh, and an enormous danger for the country of having major electoral uh, battles between people who are basically trying to survive uh, politically, doing what they perceive and many others do needs to be done, and those who talk a kind of fantasy world where we could change radically, have no more uh, uh, nefarious political activity and cut back substantially on our activities because people will take responsibility to do those activities in the family or maybe in small town meetings. Uh, and we would have the possibility of cutting our taxes, which would be aligned somewhat carefully with, with our uh, replacement of public activity with private activity. And the, the, the cutting of taxes would make this, at least for people who earn a little money, a much happier place. And my question to you is, have you thought about getting information, stuff you understand, into the minds of general public and media so that we have, and Jefferson said that, you know, if you don't like expenditure on education, try running a country without education. Right. And so I think that you folks face a real challenge of how do you get your insight more generally understood? He has the resident political science room actually take over credits first. And in many respects, Bill Spring raises an internal question about perception versus what we might say is reality, at least in terms of statistical reality. Uh, for a long time, for example, the federal budget, there was always a question raised that, you know, in surveys, what percentage of the federal budget goes to uh, foreign aid? And typically, citizens respond by saying, well, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent of the federal budget goes to foreign aid, when the reality was it was usually about 1 percent. Uh, non-military foreign aid. Um, why the gap? Why the disjuncture between perception and reality? And partly it's involved in the very function that the moment we start paying taxes, and the moment that government expends money in a general budget for other things, not us personally, is a disjuncture between our perception about what we pay in our taxes every April 15th and where it goes. I mean, and indeed, the, one of the most, when I do this with my undergraduates, one of the most interesting dynamics is watching, uh, when I do, I do a, a survey my colleagues and I do the same thing, we ask them to sort of guess what percentage of the federal budget goes toward which areas, and invariably they're wrong. Because the perception is, of course, the budget is going, the federal budget or any budget is going toward people that I don't like. <laughs> or things I don't like. And I think that's at the root of it. I mean, it is the visible, usually it's the visible spending on people not like me, or for things I don't like that creates that disjuncture of it. Um, my best example of this is, this is the classic, is the person using food stamps to buy the steak. <laughs> you know, when the person who's not in food stamps is only buying hamburger. That's the sort of classic urban story that we all sort of have seen, and yet that becomes, in fact, embedded in the mindset that the money is simply going to people or things that I don't like. So that's part of the disjuncture. Uh, it's an internal one, it's nothing new. And indeed, during crisis periods, it becomes even more, I think, um, uh, uh, sort of compelling in the public discourse. The trick, of course, is in, in generating a public discourse on it. So I'll leave it to our, our panelists to continue. So can I jump right in following on that point? Because I think one of the more disturbing aspects to me of this year's campaigning is the degree to which there's a suggestion by, again, these, these um, campaigners who, um, you know, some of them are Tea Party, some are, are not, who, imply that if we just stopped giving benefits to immigrants, everything would be fine. So just roll up the carpet, the red carpet, that much, and the budget would be solved. And it's, you know, that's um, a, a very big cultural shift, I think, for for us as a as a society to be putting that much emphasis on it. And I, you know, last year, um, we worked really hard to, the government worked really hard to 
maintain health care, basic health care for uh, legal immigrants, and the, the lack of support for that in the legislature was staggering. We just hear this magnified across the country, and so I couldn't agree more that that's a factor, especially this year. Um, with respect to how do we get the message out, it's, it's a great question and it's a really hard one. I want to give um, kudos again to Mike for year in and year out being a really credible voice coming from the business community um, to talk about the impacts of the, the kinds of potentially cataclysmic cuts that would be required by this, this rollback, the, uh, the one that was on the ballot a couple of years ago. Now, often, um, it's hard for, so elected officials are, have certain, uh, and, and public sector organizations have some constraints on them about how to raise money for campaigns of this type. Um, often it's um, groups that appear to be self-interested, like public, public employee unions, who are the ones who have the money to put out there for campaigns against tax cuts, and that can be very, you know, that's sort of a double-edged sword because they're seen as self-interested in, in saving budgets. So when there are there are credible leaders who come from a different vantage point, i.e. representing the business community, who can add their voices to that, it's very powerful. But Mike um, is only one guy. So <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, we have to, it, it's a really interesting point about, and, and an important one about how many more voices can be added to his to, to make sure that this information gets out to people that fundamentally don't want to hear this, right? Because we all want, I said to Julie, right? You know, this is like, I, I, even though I know that the only way I can lose 15 pounds is to eat less and exercise more, I really want to believe that ad that says there's an easy fix. But people want, you know, you know that you have to pay the taxes, you know this is the price for civilization, but someone who's giving you a really, it sounds promising, it's an easy way out, just, you know, I can still have what I want and pay less, that sounds, it's, it sounds so good, maybe it's, maybe it's true, and I'll probably know what it is, but this is, this is a very, very hard problem. And there's not a lot of time between now and the election. Comments on both of these. In terms of getting the word out, just so you know, we will be doing a report, are doing, it's almost final, a report on question three, essentially a written version of the presentation, which will be probably out next Tuesday, Wednesday, be up on our website. And we do a lot of work with the media editorial boards and so forth, because obviously the, the public, I mean, it's accessible, but uh, in terms of trying to get translate impact, I do a lot of work with the media as, as a way. So, um, but that will be available, and feel free to use it in any way, obviously, that, that you would like. The perception reality, a couple of comments, um, and I think, Chris, your, that your thoughts are right on, on the mark. And it's always been thus, but I do think in the last 30 years, we've had a political culture that has grown in which the, um, the disc it, there is a, a disconnect between the obvious fact that taxes and services are related. Mm -hmm. That what you, you can't produce this, I mean service, if you don't have some revenues. And people, as you say, always resisted that, and, that, and it was a, somebody else's service. But we've had 30 years, uh, and it's gained more and more steam, in which uh, the obvious fact that there's some connection is somehow not true, but of course it's true. So there's levels of this, but nonetheless, so I think, um, and then that combined with the issue of the media and, uh, and, and let, therefore less attention paid to it, I think that gap has become greater. Um, and I will say one thing in terms of Massachusetts, the kind of stories about our pension abuse excesses that people know, the, 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 uh, that have come to light over the last, um, couple of years. They, the cost of those is minimal in terms of actual cost and the issue of, of balancing budgets. But the cost in terms of public trust of government is huge. And I think that's one of the realities <coughs> that, that behind this. And that's why I think we don't only need to do the reforms in order to use the dollar, the precious dollars we have for services. We also need to rein in the excesses so that we can build greater trust uh, in what it is the government does and should do. 
I couldn't agree more. You know, the governor believes that too, and that was you know, among the reasons why he pursued pension reform, ethics and lobbying reform, and some of the other reforms that I mentioned, because he understands that the not doing those is not only um, economically costly, but um, costly in terms of reputation and state services. So many of the abuses of the type that Mike was just talking about through sort of double dipping um, you know, and, and excessive pensions and people getting a year's worth of service for a, a day, a year's worth of pension for a day of service. Um, Governor filed and the legislature passed a bill that, that um, curtailed many of those more, more visible um, abuses. Alan, do you want to come to that Actually, I have one more thought on that, and then we'll get another question. And also, one of, the, one of the differences could be also be that what states spend their money on has shifted over the years. Um, that the money now is going toward less visible kinds of, of spending, oftentimes for individuals with special needs or other individuals, and doesn't have that visibility in terms of new roads, parks, et cetera, that it might have had 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Proportionally speaking, the visibility of what government produces has changed dramatically, in both at federal and state government levels, I mean, in terms of what we see for the money. The stimulus package is a good example. In the 19th, everybody talked about comparison to the world, the world 1930s. The effects in the 30s were a lot of physical changes, a lot of people hired to build things. This time around, it's to stabilize the economy through much more complex ways that are less visible to people. So I think, in fact, Part of it also is the nature of what government spends its money on has changed dramatically in some respects. Again, it's a perception versus reality. Along, I think that's very important. Along those lines, what has struck me in the several fiscal crises that I view here in uh, Massachusetts <clears throat> I, is that it takes, when people really begin to pay attention is when it gets down to the cities and towns because that becomes very visible to people in the schools, police, fire, trash collection, libraries, and so forth. Um, and uh, so much of what the state does is a pass-through, if you will, or services for people who are out of the limelight. Mm -hmm. okay. But citizens, um, if if I uh, make a simplistic uh, uh, suggestion regarding the gap between uh, perception and, and reality, it would be very useful if in the upcoming uh, gubernatorial debates there was a panel of experts next to the candidates <laughs> and challenge them on the facts because it's not the fault of the public that doesn't know. Doesn't know because they are not informed. So I don't know how you could bring about either a commentary after the debates, or even better, to have an informed representative of the public challenge the pronouncements of the candidates on the debate the issue. Uh, this would be, I think, a useful reform. The, the other thing is, uh, we heard from, uh, Leslie, a very uh, good analysis of what happened in the previous administration, would be very interested to have uh, at least representatives from the candidates to come and explain and defend the positions that the, that the candidates are taking during the, the debate to have a discussion of some kind so that we are informed. So that's a simplistic suggestion that I make. <laughs> it's more of an observation if they want to follow up on that. I mean, I think the whole part about debates has been an eternal one, by the way, you know, how you structure it. And the reality is the candidates will only volunteer to be in debates when they think they're on you know, the grounds they want to debate on. Um, so I think it's been very hard to get ground rules for debates set that everyone will agree to and show up. So it's a, it's a little tough one. At the end of the day, though, I mean, in many respects, it's up to the candidates and their campaigns to get the facts up, the challenge the facts. I mean, because that's how campaigns work. So I mean, I mean, we've played with this kind of history of arbiters of truth for a long time and they never seem to work very well. So, all right, next question or observation. Um, so I listened to this information and I'm concerned. Um, because we as a country, it's not just as a commonwealth, but as a country we're suffering. 
um, on many levels. And I, the question that I have is, there are a number of, um, I, well, I want to say influential, but you know, some of the people I question as to the validity of their influence, quite frankly. But they are fanning the flames of misperception. And, um, and you know, I mean, if you just take a look at what happened with the healthcare debate, you know, and the notion of death counts, and where that came from, and how the politicians in their in their town hall meetings couldn't even challenge the people who were leveling, you know, gross misrepresentations until Barney Barney Friends, who did, you know, in his absolutely spectacular <laughs> handling of a woman who absolutely didn't know what she was talking about. But there was not one politician prior to that encounter that questioned the people who were hurling these allegations at them. Not once asked, where did you get that information? Not one. And so there, I think it's incumbent upon the politicians, and I also think it's incumbent upon the people of the press to have some type of responsibility to provide you know, a realistic picture. But how do you get to that place? I guess we've had several uh, variations on the theme, basically, the sort of dilemma of democracy, in a sense. It's not a dilemma of fiscal, it's a dilemma of democracy. Um, let me give a quick observation about the healthcare debate. I think this gets at part of it and the burden we put on average citizens to make sense of things. Um, I think, in many respects, you, you, you put your finger on an, an eternal problem. As we expect citizens to take as much time as we policy want to, to learn the ins and outs of very complex legislation or very complex laws, and someone makes sense out of it. And that's an unfair burden on citizens, up to those intermediaries in the political world and everybody else do the same thing. And I think it's not surprising in a, in a highly complex piece of legislation for a part of it to be twisted in a way and that people who sort of don't know how to respond to it because, in fact, it's not, they're not quite certain what the legislation means itself. When you have very complex legislation like that, healthcare has been the best example of just amazingly complex legislation. It is not surprising that you get it, get these kind of debates. On the other hand, you still got health care reform enacted. So, you know, it's, 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 but this is not a physical question. This is a question of democracy. It's, it's tough. It's a tough one. But isn't all physical policy really tied into democracy? Of course. Yeah. I mean, yes. you, you can't, can't, you can't separate. It. That's right. And that's my point. It is about yeah. democracy. It's a messy business. Questions? Let's go ahead. Uh, my question uh, is more of an observation about the information getting out. Uh, does the treasurer can send out through the globe a, a, um, a, a description of all the money that is being held on behalf of individuals? Why isn't it possible for the governor to put a similar kind that just says these are the facts about the state budget, not necessarily everything, but in a piecemeal form that the public can become educated? And in a similar fashion, uh, Mr. Whitmer, I've seen several times, I uh, would certainly like to have a videotape of his presentation because there are community groups that would like to have this, and Northeastern should have some, some similar one. Uh, my, my daughter is an attorney in the state of Washington, and the Washington Supreme Court has a system that if you want to see your daughter uh, present a case before the Supreme Court, you send $10 and they send you a dispatch. Um, I doubt if it makes any money for them, but it certainly is a way that this information should go well beyond the hundred or so people here out into the public. Uh, we just aren't learning enough of us that have that kind of linkages to, to make that kind of a difference. And, and obviously Mr. Whitman has made us a very solid case that we've got to do something on this. I don't want you to respond to that, uh, uh, Mr. Whitman, uh, just because you were in state government, and I'm sure this issue I have a quick point before he goes on. We do take these presentations and do have them on our website. Um, so we'll make sure that policyschool.edu.edu will be on there. Right. I, I've been told it's on the website, but that's for me only. Yeah. I'm talking about for a group, that you could hold it for a group. Yeah. Uh, we have a Democratic Work Committee in Boston that would like to have this, we'd like to have a public forum on these three 
these out questions. So if we had this kind of videotape, that would certainly present the side of that Steely would be impacted. Figure out if we have the capacity to do that, yeah. Go ahead, everyone responded. Just with respect to the treasurer's ability to put out his abandoned property list, there's a state law that he implements, that has to um, implement and, and enforce that um, allows the treasurer to do it. And the fact that, you know, in a campaign year that can sort of look like, you know, it's another opportunity for, for the treasurer to be associated with good news, uh, but, but it does relate to a particular statute that has a budget associated with it for, for publishing those materials. Um, not clear to me exactly how the governor would be able to, I mean, there's no such law allowing that or, or requiring the governor to put out information, and I assume that there would be, um, there would be objections to it, but it, it's an interesting point. But, but is there a law that prevents him from doing it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Probably not, but I don't think the Globe or independent, I mean, a paper would, just, would allow a governor or a candidate, especially when running for re-election, to do that. Um, so I think, I mean, the under Leslie's stewardship, uh, the, the this administration, uh, when they present their budgets, put out a lot of terrific analysis of uh, where the state spent its money. So in that sense, and that's available on the, the web. web. On the web. So in a sense, it's available. Um, it gets back to the issue of individuals uh, trying to access it. Um, but one of the, I mean, obviously what we try to do as an independent group is present information. And I should mention, um, Nancy Wagner came up and introduced herself, she's here, uh, from the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center. And they put out a lot of very good information on uh, state finances and so forth. So there are resources available, but um, it takes initiative to access them. Questions on the, uh, sir, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, over the summer, I read a book uh, by uh, Jared Diamond called Collapse, uh, the, the, the Why Some Societies Fail and Others Survive. And so now I, I take the theme from that book and ask it about almost every area of someone's expertise. The theme is that to survive, some societies have to give up dearly held beliefs, mm -hmm. values, traditions in order to survive, others may collapse. I'm wondering if you see any such things that we in Massachusetts have to learn to get along with or change our attitude about in order to survive and thrive mm -hmm. uh, over the next uh, generation. Great question. Wow. <laughs> Talk about the elf in the room. Um, <laughs> good. Great question. I mean, the, the larger question about our Samaritan society, I mean, it, it is, I won't try to, I, I've thought a bit about that, and, you know, we have been so successful because of our, the richness of our land, and, uh, you know, we're not going to be number one anymore, and I'm not sure how we're going to react to that over the next century. Half century, uh, as a society, I mean. and um, and it's going to be. I think it's going to challenge us, and just the way will we be able to adjust? Um, you know what I see out there right now. I don't like what I see in terms of our ability to adjust to some of the the, the, the changing realities of the world. Bringing it down to a very more mundane Massachusetts level, um, I come back to the. This sounds mundane, but it really, it isn't in terms of the fiscal realities of particularly cities and towns. We have created a benefit structure that is impossible to sustain. And it was created in an era when we could pay for it. Well, we could pay for it in part, and then we deferred the obligations in part. But the chickens are coming home too. And so we have a benefit structure in the public sector, particularly at the city and town level, because changes have been made at the state level, in health care and pensions, which is so vastly more generous than the benefits in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So it's not only fiscally unsustainable, but I think it's politically unsustainable. But as I mentioned earlier, have the power of public employee unions and change and so I think one of the, which your question prompts me, is one of the stories 
major stories of the next 10 years in this state is how are we going to deal with that? It will, democracy is difficult, so we know it's going to be messy. But will we make progress on, on that front? We certainly, we have to, because, I mean, it, it, it's critical in terms of financing the reality, the, 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 pro, the services, schools, police, fire, everything, you know, at the city and town level in Massachusetts. Well, uh, I think the problems we have have been developing for decades and decades, uh, and they're partly the result of the success of our market economy. Um, I go back to a book that John Kenneth Galbraith wrote in 1959 or 60 <laughs> called The Athlete Society, uh, in which he observed that, uh, uh, it, and the, the American uh, economy was, was growing and doing well, and wealth was increasing. We have a very wealthy country, not to mention wealthy state, in terms of total aggregate wealth. And his point was that societies have to learn how to live and spend that wealth wisely. And that hasn't happened yet in the, in the society we have because it's so individualistic based. Uh, you're taught to think that the incomes that you make you earn by your own efforts. It has nothing to do with the rest of society or the way institutions are structured. And until you learn how to spend our wealth wisely, and that means in, in Galbraith's book, it was the right balance of uh, public versus private goods, uh, we're going to continue to have this debate and conflict over, uh, over the size of government and, and taxes versus the, the paycheck that you take home. Actually, I have an additional observation. It is that we're a political one. We have a political system, adding on what Alan said about individualism, we have a political system that embeds in it the ability of well-organized groups. The classic Madisonian observation of the, the ability of well-organized groups to get what they want, <laughs> uh, whether they're tax cuts or direct benefits. Um, this is that true at any level of government, the ability to be well organized to get whatever benefits they want at the expense of the undifferentiated mass public. That's an eternal dilemma. It's becoming more acute, I think, in the last generation, as in fact we've got on the whack on, on our fiscal house. And it, so it is a, a dilemma of the political system. A political system, for example, where the U.S. Senate is so dysfunctional now in structural terms that it's almost impossible to get anything done without 60 votes. There's no way the Constitution mandates that. It's, it's sort of it, it metamorphosed over time to a point where literally it is, it is becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And we have historical examples you know, you know, about where political systems fail uh, to, in fact, you know, do with the right thing. And I'm worried that as a political system, we are failing our future. Um, and that's, and that's, a, that's an embedded dilemma of American democracy. Question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, back in the back and then back in front. Good. Uh, hi. I have a question about Medicaid. Uh, it was represented that it will become or is 34% of the budget. Can you give us some facts, what it is, where it goes, what the growth rate is likely to be, and what the impact of that growth rate uh, is likely to be as well? Well, you don't have a healthcare expert in in our group, so this is a, it's a challenging question. But but Mass Health is um, is subsidized healthcare for low income uh, residents of the Commonwealth. There are eligibility requirements through Mass Health. There is a guarantee that um, every child will have health insurance if their parents can't provide it. Um, for adults, there there are income eligibility guidelines. Um, and there are several programs, there are at least two major programs through which the state provides subsidized health care. Some services are delivered directly um, by organizations uh, contracted with the state and, and 
the state also makes payments to hospitals and doctors to provide services to um, Medicaid, Med Mass Health eligible um, uh, in residents of the Commonwealth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's um, right in uh, during the last couple of years of the recession, we're seeing enrollment grow at the rate of five or so percent a year. Um, the um, dollar increases are more in the uh, range of 9% per year. That's actually reflecting a lot of cuts that have been made to the program, certain programs within MassHealth um, that the state has had to make in areas where it's possible to trim. There's a, um, a uh, widely publicized discussion of the fact that Massachusetts actually provides some optional services through MassHealth. And those are obviously places where one might look for additional savings, but when I tell you that that includes um, uh, mental health and substance abuse programs, prosthetics, uh, pharmacy for people receiving mass health, I mean, some of the things, they may sound optional, but in fact, they're really um, necessary to be part of the, the health care for those individuals. Mass health is, is the single biggest um, budget category, it's got the biggest growth in the budget year over year, and it's, uh, growth in, in healthcare costs was um, one of the, the, the way the state provided it before our healthcare program, um, it was expensive, and the federal government, which provides basically 50 cents on the dollar of what the state spends in mass health, um, required the state to make changes in order to continue getting a federal subsidy. That was one of the drivers of mass healthcare reform in order to help um, bring our program in line with federal requirements. So this is a very challenging problem. It's not getting easier. I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to represent that the program hasn't been subjected to cuts, but it is very hard to cut it because of federal requirements on the one hand, and on the other hand, the very real needs of folks in the Commonwealth to have help with healthcare, which is obviously one of the most expensive um, elements of quality of life. In, in addition to low income, many uh, children, um, families of children, um, you have two other broad categories, uh, the disabled, uh, and then seniors. So I can't recall the percent, but in terms of all the people in nursing homes in the Commonwealth, some huge percent uh, are paid by Medicaid. Uh, they either don't have the assets or spend down the assets. And then they, when they go into the nursing home, Medicaid picks up that cost. So that's a huge popular, huge cost as a piece of the Medicaid puzzle. I understand it's about two thirds go to nursing homes and one third for health services hospitals. And uh, another contributing factor the demographic trends and economic ones, right? You know, we have an aging population. And that means that uh, particularly those those uh, uh, nursing home and disabled costs will rise just because uh, the population is aging. Uh, like other metropolitan areas, the in income distribution has become more more unequal uh, uh, over time in Massachusetts, and and uh, that uh, reflects economic trends related to the world the economic development, and that's that affects. Uh, bottom of the distribution as well with the demand for uh, Medicaid. Uh, one, one quick point, yeah. was, just say it, uh, Leslie mentioned the caseload increase. The the irony, if you will, but, but, it's, a, uh, but it's, it's a critical point, is that the services provided by government, like Medicaid and human services, tend to be needed more and the caseload increase at the very time that government has less capacity to provide because of recessions and uh, stock market collapses. Next question. Hi, I'd just like to go back to the issue of perception versus reality because I think the issue is deeper than perception versus reality. I think it's an issue of there is a responsibility to educate citizens and no one really seems to have hold that responsibility to educate the citizens of the Commonwealth. And I think that as citizens, we have a right to know this is how much money we have provided to our government, and this is how the money has been spent. 
spent, and I think it could be done simply as having an annual report card that is very high level, that's the equivalent of an annual report that says, these are the big ticket items of where revenue came from, these are the big ticket items of how it was spent, and here are the projections. So that there's a concerted effort made to level the playing field so that citizens are finding out through their tax bills and their water bills and their whatever, what that report card says, and then they're prepared when we get to the point where the solution is you have to raise taxes, that they understand that there's some preparation of the population to understand this, because otherwise it's never going to get tax cut, tax increase passed. So that's just a comment. I think we have time for one more. We have a gentleman back there. I'm going patiently. Maybe, maybe it's me too. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to get back really quickly to the um, the revenue gap um, and the question that I had. I think the insights earlier were helpful about um, the income tax as being uh, a location where we could look to try to um, increase the the tax revenue um, fairly. Um, but what I was wondering is, um, in addition to that, given the uh, the numbers and the prospects for 2012 and um, the immediate need, is there anything uh, that any of you would uh, suggest as to how that gap might be uh, made up on a short-term basis? Um, and would there be something supplemental uh, to a longer-term fix of adjusting uh, the income tax that you would implement, also given uh, the general economic situation and the fears of um, having any sort of deleterious effect with um, depressing the economy or shocking people by, by implementing that, something that's a short term. So balancing those two realities, do you have any suggestions? Uh, of would you implement something in the short term um, to, to close that gap before the economy as a whole recovers? Thank you. Well, but barring uh, revenue increases, there's there's really little to nothing that the uh, state can do. They're constrained to have a balanced budget. Uh, if they veer from that much, they, they'll be hit by uh, uh, downgrading in, in their uh, credit ratings, and, and the Constitution requires the budget to be balanced. Uh, this is unlike the federal government that, that can run deficits uh, or, or print money. Uh, uh, the states don't have, almost every state does not have that option. So uh, it, it doesn't look good uh, if you're not going to be able to raise revenue uh, by raising taxes. Okay. Well, I, first of all, I'd like again to thank our guests. say that you know this is one of the most difficult areas for people for anybody to grasp to deal with in any complex way and then that broader question that we are all trying to wrestle with is how do we get a handle on this as citizens not just as sort of policy wonks like us uh, how, do, how do citizens get a handle on this for whatever their view I mean again it's not you know whatever view people have about how the money should be spent there has to be a vibrant democratic discourse about it and we worry that we don't get that vibrant democratic discourse as we ought to, uh, no matter what your political views are about this. Um, I'll give over to John for a minute for housekeeping, then I'll sum it up for the evening. All right, thank you. I just want to take a brief moment to show you the website in case you haven't been on it already. This is the Policy School website. You can get to the Open Classroom either through this tab or this one. This one's pretty obvious, it says Open Classroom. Then you get here and you have all these tabs. The one in particular that I wanted to click on for you is readings and video. We get readings up there eventually. We have a few. We have a few. For, and, um, for instance, for tonight, we have two links, one to publications by the Mass Taxpayers Association, and one is a link to the Mass Budget Policy Center. I'm gonna open that in a new tab just to show you. One of the things that, well, I'll wait for that. In addition, this is where you'll find the videos. And when you click on this tab, 
you'll see the videos from last week. They're on YouTube, but they're embedded here. You can just watch them here. <laughs> or you could uh, watch it on YouTube. You can open up a new window and you know, watch it on YouTube. Kill it now, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just wanted to go back and show you this. There's a lot of great stuff. Both here, there's even a, this is, this sends you to the mass budget tax primer, which explains the mass budget. And similarly, uh, Mike's organization has a lot of great stuff. Do you want to come <laughs> Yeah, let me just say I work for the Mass Budget Policy Center. And I also want to point people here to up in the corner, if you click on that white button that says budget browser, there's been some question about how do you learn what the state spends its money on. And you, you'll see this, gives, this is an interactive tool that allows you to answer this question for yourself. So I just wanted to point people to our website and to that little button up in the corner so you can Take a look at this and for some of your own questions about how to save spending money. I mean, I'm going to plug, maybe you folks could do a link to um, the governor's budget because, as Mike said, we, uh, we pioneered a lot more material, informative, informational materials um, to go out with the budget to explain um, what's in it, how it's constructed, how policy decisions were made, and you can, you can actually see um, all of the different versions through legislative action as well. So as you see, there is information out there. The difficulty, and I think this is what people touched upon, is how do you get it out there? How do people understand it? What impacts does it have? And again, I think at the end of the day, that's really a question about our political system and about our, our way we run our campaigns and our media, perhaps. And those are big questions. Next week, an important, albeit perhaps smaller question than some of the ones we touched on today, public employee unions. Mike Ross, city councilor, president, and Richard Stutman, Boston Teachers Union. And in the middle, Barry Bluestone. <laughs> Be here early, get a good seat. We'll see you next week.